thank you very much. Uh, because of the unusual circumstances, I think maybe you should have a slight explanation of the facts of the matter, mm -hmm. just for general preservation. And if you can't hear me, I'll ask them to make the microphone a little louder, because at the present time I'm not in good voice either. But uh, I have been in a health problem without knowing it. For about a year and a half, I haven't enjoyed walking very much. And I said, well, you don't at 85. At least it's not unusual. So it got a little worse all the time. First, you know, I didn't like to climb stairs. And then steps. And then I wasn't too happy on the level. <laughs> and finally, uh, it became obvious that... Uh, either I was advancing in age very rapidly or something else was wrong. The answer is something else was wrong. And uh, what was wrong has been growing and developing and unfolding for a year and a half. And it came to a head after I came back from Sedona. It came to a head because it was ready to. Nothing there particularly contributed to it. It just proved conclusively that I couldn't do these things. So then I got a little help, and I've been under physical therapy uh, ever since, and we're gaining on it. And they tell me that the chances of a good recovery are all right. The blood pressure is normal, uh, the heart is right, and there's no cholesterol, so I may get well. <laughs> I've never, I haven't been a good walker for some time, and I'm not improving. But I may have to develop the necessary physical exercises. But this was not something that hit me as an innocent bystander. It was something that has been developing, and you probably have noticed it yourself. So I may not have thought of it particularly. But you've noticed that there have been young men standing by the way when I leave the platform to kind of help me out, and little things like that. That's been going on for a long time. But they tell me because of the fact that it did show itself as what it really is, that it uh, will probably respond to improvement. Now, our subject this morning is the 17, in the 17th chapter of Acts, Paul on the Hill of Mars. The personality of St. Paul is one of the most controversial in Christian theology. First, he was an ardent anti-Christian, then he was an ardent Christian. By doing this, he managed to alienate both groups. <laughs> he managed to outrage the school of Heliol and Gamaliel, which he belonged to in Judaism, and he frightened the apostles to death. Nobody liked Paul for some reason, probably himself, and it's sometimes doubtful from the text that he liked himself very well. It was a very strange thing, but he was a man of destiny, no matter how you want to figure it. And the importance of his position is just beginning to be noticeable. At the time when uh, the Protestant Reformation took over, there was a very strong division between the old orthodoxy and something new, something represented by things such as the Rosicrucians and the alchemists and the mystics. And uh, in this division, we saw the real division between Peter and Paul. We saw Peter's church at Rome and the Cathedral of St. Paul in London, the two great anchors of the Christian theology. The uh, Western branch, which came over to the United States, was mostly composed of the Paul Polit party. Uh, St. Paul inspired most of New England, and uh, the reason for this was that Paul broke away from the insistency of an intercessor between the individual and God. Uh, the, uh, Paul took the attitude that deity was available to all and could be directly approached by those who wished to supplicate God for one purpose or reason or another. There was no need for an um, intimate matter character, no person between, only the, the noble heart, the contrite spirit, and the prayer 
and the dedication of life. This was the basis of the Protestant Reformation. Now, the founding fathers of our country, which we are much interested in at the present moment, uh, were mostly of the Protestant religious denominations. They believed very largely in the principles of Paul, which, however, unless you are a student of the subject and read his writings carefully, you may not notice the tremendous emphasis upon personal liberty and the disciplining of life to carry liberty with dignity. Now, this was certainly involved and incorporated into the Bill of Rights. It was certainly part of all New England with its religious dedications. It was in the spirit of Emerson and Thoreau, and most of all, it was in the spirit of mysticism. The one convert were mentioned in the occasion of Paul's visit to the Hill of Mars was Dionysus the Areopagite. And the mysticism of Dionysus, the mystical experience, was the first great written mystical book of Christian theology. It was probably written in Alexandria, but it was certainly a book suitable to the mind of people like Bamey and William Law and the pietists of Pennsylvania. It was a book of devotion, dedication to a mystic overall, a great picture, a great principle of things. Paul tells us in his own words that God put the same blood in every human being. Now this is regardless of nation, race, or demarc. We are all one in the circulation of the blood and spirit of God. Now this, of course, would cause, and did cause, considerable controversy, but I think it also gave us to understand the meaning of a statement that was made by a uh, British author some years ago, Gerald Massey, namely, the Jesus of Peter and the Christ of Paul. The apostles, for most of them, personally acquainted with Jesus for a period of several years. They were of his race and of his faith. They were uh, constantly associated with him and developed a tremendous personal affection for him. He became the embodiment of that which was most desirable, most lovable, and most sacred. Paul never had this experience. His first experience with Christ was on the road to Damascus, where in a vision the Lord appeared to him. So his first experience with Christianity was a vision, not a familiarity, not a long association, but a sudden impact of a supernatural event. We can see how this affected Paul and why it changed him in a moment from an enemy of Christianity to one of its greatest martyred exponents. But it was definitely true that to Paul, the Christ in you is the hope of glory. And in God and in Christ we live and move and have our being. And uh, as he says in this chapter, the poet says, we are his children. This poet was Eratos of Soli, the great writer of the phenomenon of astronomy, which Paul evidently understood. Paul had another distinction that separated him from the rest of the group. Paul was a citizen of Rome. And in that time, this was a very important consideration. At the time of the siege of Tarsus, when the Romans came to take the city, the city did not resist, but opened its doors and accept the Romans, to accept the Romans. As a result of that, the Romans spared the city completely, did not pillage it or worry it or bother it in any way, and made every inhabitant of Tarsus a, and a citizen of Rome. Now, this citizenship descended to Saul, later Paul, and became the basis of a great many privileges and opportunities otherwise impossible. It was impossible, according to Roman law, that anyone should be convicted or condemned without, doubt, without a due process of law. Every effort had to be made for justice. This was not true with non-citizens. 
So Paul had this distinction of being able to travel with comparative impunity. He has considerable language, was able to speak better and more often and uh, more carefully than most of the other early Christian writers and authors. He was definitely an, a well-educated member of the school of Hillel, one of the most liberal of all the great schools of the uh, Pharisees of Israel. So we have a Paul as a unique person, but we also have another a very interesting in point and quality with him, and that is this ne not to have an intercessor because Christ in you. And if Christ in you be lifted up, it will bring all other things to it. So he was definitely a person of the same mind as the fathers of the Bill of Rights who were many of them followers of Paul religiously. This was, that, as Paul expresses it, the inalienable right of liberty. But Paul also brings out the other point, that liberty is dangerous unless it is handled with discipline. A free person must be a self-moving, self-correcting, self-enlightening person. It was not possible for a free person to do as he pleases simply because freedom gives him this legal right. Freedom gives every man the right to be right. Now this may seem more uh, controversial, but actually we are in that condition today. We are now looking for the possibilities of finding the individual who has a right to be right. We also realize that freedoms have gradually added up uh, to lawlessness, to various forms of cupidity and exploitation. We know that freedom is not reasonable, practical, or useful unless that which is free is able to govern itself. Paul makes a great point in his various essays on self-government, and uh, some of these points were picked up by Dr. Cousins in some of his books recently. In any event, Paul became a symbol of the eternal universality of the Christ mystery and ministry. He beheld a universal value, a value that was above all creeds and denominations, a level of integration that was truly a proof that one blood, the blood of God, flowed in every living thing and should be respected. Having been a tyrant and a persecutor himself, Paul spoke out strongly for tolerance, spoke out definitely that the, no religion should take from the individual the right to think or to take from him the right of fair decision, but only a truly enlightened person could handle religion effectively. It was more than faith, it was hope, and most of all, it was love. And uh, he agreed strongly with the viewpoint of Gandhi that uh, we can tie the world together permanently with nothing stronger than the circle cord of love. So here we have a man who had a very materialistic background and was a very bitter man in many ways who suddenly becomes the exponent of a doctrine which was not, in his mind, entirely intended for the Holy Land. Most of the apostles would have been happy if it had resulted in the freedom of Israel. But to him, Israel was the world. To him, Israel was all mankind. And therefore, with him, a great process of missionary work was carried on. Now, some people think that the early missionary work must have been very difficult and very arduous, but it was not so bad for the reason that we learned from Eusebius what the actual state of the Christian faith was at the time of Paul. We find this also to be found in the Acts and in several sections of the New Testament. Jesus had twelve apostles, seventy-two disciples and 500 of the brethren. This is what is stated in the Bible. Therefore, he had a basic unit. Wherever an apostle went, he usually took a disciple with him. 
and if this was not possible, he would take one of the brethren. Therefore, scattered all over that area, as a result of early uh, proselyting or early conversions, there was a nucleus of Christians capable of actually evangelizing in many areas. We know they evangelized, they evangelized as low far as India and China. We know they traveled over most of the earth, carrying with them the message, largely the message of Paul, because the message of Paul was the one which touched them all, which made them realize that they were one family. Paul makes a great point of the human family to get away and beyond all these divisions in individual domestic relationships and world affairs that we should always consider ourselves as one unit of life a life that is embodied in flesh but in the soul belongs to God so we have Paul's concept one soul divided among all that lives and yet undivided this uh, furthermore is another point that he carries with considerable emphasis in his sermon at the Artifigus, which, by the way, is the place where Socrates was condemned to death. But uh, to Paul, there was this further consideration that has to be brought in mind always, the consideration that each living thing, not only human but all others, is, is entitled to justice. It's entitled to rightness and is entitled to address prayer, thought, meditation to the inner life because the God who listens, the God who can hear, is the unknown God which Paul found inscribed upon the tablet on the side of the hill of Mars. He came upon this and he turned to the Athenians and he said that he would tell them of the God that they did not know how to worship, that they did not know that this unknown God was the true God. And why did he call it an unknown God? Because they had not worshipped it, but had worshipped many gods and godlings. But he also stated that he believed them to be a religious people, but that they had to have this new concept, the new concept of the one unknown God. Now, the problem of the unknown God was not easily solved. Paul had his own definition for it. But the term remains, and in the Bible it appears in two forms. In some translations, it's an unknown God, and in other translations, it's the unknown God. Now, there's a great deal of difference in these terms. It is perfectly possible to assume that the, Rome, that the Greeks were paying tribute uh, to the deities of other peoples or to some deity that they did not worship themselves but which they acknowledged. More likely and more correctly in all probabilities, the unknown God remains as we know it today, the unknown God. In, day, in theology, science, philosophy, ethics, morality, the mystery of the unknown God has not been actually solved. It has not been solved because the conflict of meanings also includes the conflicts that arise from sectarianism and from the levels of integration or intelligence upon which people function. The unknown God is still with us, and we are still searching for the true answer to that mystery. We have concepts of deity. We have many religions with great sets of deities. We have our own religion with a holy triad. We have many other sects, Muslimism with only one God in the form of Allah. All these are seeking for God. But Buddhas, the Jains, the Farsis, the Sikhs, the Brahmins, the Muslims, the American Indians, the ancient Mayas and Aztecs, the Greeks, Romans, the Egyptians, and Phoenicians, all had their definitions and interpretations of God. 
Yet in many cases, these were not identical. And as Paul notes in the connection with matter also, time has something to do with this. Opin opinions about deity change with time, with experience, with the searchings of human beings for better understanding, for philosophy, for all these different things. And Paul points out very definitely that God cannot live in a house made by the hands of man. He doesn't live that way. He is not responsible to the world for his glory, for his wisdom, or for his truth. Whatever deity is, is inconceivable to the average person. The only thing we can do is moralize it as an infinite spirit of good, an infinite wisdom, a great mercy. But we know it only through the written word of other mortals. The Bible was not written by the very finger of God, but by the lovers of God. And everywhere we turn, the great question still remains, what is God? How do we explain creation? How can we explain what science is discovering every day? How can we gain the secrets which science is abusing every day? We do not know. We go further and further into the mystery of life, but it seems to go on and on. And as veil upon veil we lift, we find veil upon veil behind. There does not seem to be any answer. We have atoms, we have molecules, we have neutrons, we have everything you can think of. Somewhere in the mystery of all of this is life. And Paul, I think, is trying to tell us that this one life is the important thing and that this one life has its station in each living thing. This one life is divided but remains one. It is diversified throughout time and space but is forever one. It is in everything that lives and in each thing that lives. It is not only in us but it is in our en enemies. It is in our world. It is in the animals we eat for food. It is in the birds, flowers, plants, and even in the wonderful structures of stones. It is also in the air, a mystery of life in everything. Somewhere in this mystery is the one whom, of whom Paul says, in him we live and exist and have our being. And therefore, the search for this is a search for a mystery. And out of the mystery came, uh, came what we now know as Paulian mysticism. It is the mystical approach to the answer of theology. It is the search of the individual for his participation in one divine spirit. It is part of his heritage, his legacy. It comes to him before even his birth. It is the fact that he is entitled to a share in this spirit of infiniteness which surrounds him and fills him and exists before him and will go on forever. So that the uh, problem of the God of Paul comes to be, again, a reason for individual thoughtfulness. The mo motion of religion into the personal life of the individual. Now, it's not anything wrong about the uh, doctrines, if they help us. There's no reason why we shouldn't listen to our clergymen, listen to those who expound these matters, or read good books on the subject. But beneath it all and behind it all must be the realization that all decisions are our own. We cannot decide what we do not understand. We cannot define that which we do not know. But we can, with a certain intuition, an apperception, come into a mystical sense of association with infinite life itself. This is possibly the highest form of faith that we will ever know. It was also one of the earliest. Now today we have a world divided, divided in many ways. We are celebrating an anniversary of the Bill of Rights. We are remembering with gratitude the early signers of these declarations and these bills that have helped to establish our way of life. 
In many of these there are evidences of the Paulian beliefs, and it's almost probable that most of the, the creators of these documents, being Christian Protestants, would lose the Paulian method. They might quote other things also. But in Paul they found something very useful to them. They found the realization of a complete integrity of liberty. Paul was a, a liberator. He didn't liberate nations, he liberated souls. And he was first able to do this because the vision on the road to Damascus liberated his soul. He had the personal experience of a mystical enlightenment. The miraculous happened to him. We read about it in books. We may have psychic experiences. But to Paul, this vision on the road was the greatest thing that he ever experienced. And he was convinced that if a sinner as great as himself was given this vision, it must be available to all living things. There is always, as St. Francis points out also, the fact that the greater sinner makes the greatest saint. This change of mind, this alteration of life, this sudden appearance of soul on the surface of existence, all of this is part of the Paulian concept of life, a concept which tells us very much and very often uh, that now we see through a veil darkly, but then we will see face to face. Now, uh, the point has also been made that Paul of Tarsus, or Saul of Tarsus, was in all probabilities an initiate of the pagan Greek mysteries also. And this is quite possible, if he was not an initiate, that he had some contact with those who were, and from these he gained a certain experience. He tells us he received the tonsure. This means definitely religious order. And it was not a religious order that would correspond to anything that he was interested in at the time of the occurrence. It was something that had to do with an acceptance into a foreign faith or belief, which had certain obligations, certain vows, certain requisites, and certain needs. It is also well known that Paul was a well-educated man in the terms of his day, in language, philosophy, science, and most of the arts of his time. Therefore, he was confronted with another stumbling block, the mind in relationship to the soul. The mind is more, very often the destroyer of the soul and the heart. It is the mind that excuses folly and justifies ill action simply because of expediency. The soul never actually justifies that which is not true. Consequently, the mind is the slayer of the real, and it is also in many cases the destroyer of the inner sensitivities by means of which the person might come in time to have a mystical experience of his own. The, uh, the mystical experience, as it is denominated, in the writings of Paul is definitely the inner realization of certain things. First, the total unity of God, and that God is not considered in terms of his various beliefs. It makes no difference whatever what church you belong to, or what nation you come from, or what race you belong to or what denomination you prefer, you are inevitably and eternally one with all. Your natural association is always absolute tolerance. It is the recognition of the divine right of the individual to believe and to think. And if he is virtuous in his believing and thoughtful in his thinking, he will find that which is necessary to him and find in that his part in the divine plan. And whenever the person growing up in the vicissitudes of life becomes aware of these movements within himself, he is at that time a universal believer. Paul also warns a great deal against soothsaying 
and all kinds of chicanery in this particular area. He warns against the belief in omens and all these things because they destroy, in a sense, the free will of the individual. They make him subject to something of his own invention. He can shift his labor from his own labors and works to some magical formula that will work for him. Paul doesn't believe in this at all. He believes definitely that the only magical invocation is a silent prayer in the heart. Also, that there is no road to conscious awakening apart from the perfection of nature. The individual has to grow. Growth is eternal. Growth goes on. Growth, like the unknown God, cannot be completely defined. But growth is that every day we become a little better than we were the day before. It has nothing to do with being a little richer, or a little more important to society, or a little more comfortable in housing. It, the actual improvement must be emotion toward acceptance of soul light, acceptance of the God or Christ in us, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is, according to Paul, the oil of salvation. The word Chris, Christ being it itself a word for oil. Also Paul goes into nations. He goes into different countries. He preaches to them, and for the most part, he is received with dignity. He is not always accepted. He doesn't expect to be. But he is always heard, and he is always remembered. Of course, he is partly safe because he travels under the power of Rome. But he is also safe because there's something about what he says that is very um, unsettling of hypocrisy. There is something about it. Uh, Paul was a violent man, and when he was good, he was violently good, as far as the proselyting of his ideas were concerned. But it all sums up to a very definite fact, that he could be excited on the outside, he could uh, make all kinds of powerful statements but he would also find the, the power or will to go inside and bow to that which was real. He had no reality except the Christ in himself, but he knew that it was exactly there in everyone else, and that there was no one in the world who didn't share this mystery, regardless of the name by which they knew it. And in the course of the problem of time, what was the religion to do? What was the idea that was carried forward by Dionysus Areopagus, who heard Paul and was converted by him? Uh, the, uh, the answer is very definite. It opens the invisible universe to our visible comprehension. A great example of this is Jacob Bamey, whose visions are, dis are definitely Paulian in that quality to uh, Bamey and to Paul. There was a way in which the human being could enter into the experience of the divine purpose. There was a way in which all of the things that we read about can be experienced in some way, not completely. Never will we find by any ordinary conception that which at the absolute core of life. We can only know it if we reach it, and it is the final step in the perfection of man, his re-identification with absolute deity. But this is incomprehensible uh, to the soul, even if it can be worded according to the dictionary. It is something infinitely deeper, more mysterious, and more wonderful. Paul recognized the healing power of Jesus. But he recognized this healing power not as belonging to Jesus, but God in him, or God in the healer, is simply using the divine power which was intended for that purpose. And if the healer abuses, misuses, or, or commercializes his gifts, then he is acting against God. Any good in our lives is a part of deity. Our unselfishness, our kindness, our thoughtfulness, our cheerfulness in emergency, these are divine attributes. 
If we accept them, we worship. If we reject them or fail them, we deny God. We do not have really a love of our own. It is love in us. It is a divine power which we can use in many ways. But if it's used sincerely, it's always good. If used insincerely or commercialized or prostituted, always bad. Every power we have is an attribute of deity. The misuse of any power is a kind of spiritual treason against which there is a great penalty that each person has to face. In the Orient, they call this karma. The things that we do are, re are returned to us in like measure. But Paul didn't think of it in the terms of karma. He thought of it in the terms, rather, of the, of the position we place ourselves by the misuse of ourselves. We destroy something or turn it from ourselves and become weaned from reality by our own conduct. The moment we do not follow the Sermon on the Mount and the companion thoughts and words of Paul, we lose something. It isn't that a God points down with vengeance at us and wishes us into eternal damnation. It is that when we do something essentially wrong, the Christ in us suffers, is pained, sorrows, and in the in, in sorrows of the heart and soul, the individual must pay the debt. It is something that we have in life. Everything that has been given to us is of God. And even the grains of sand are divine. And any use we make of them is sacred. And to profane them is corruption. Now put that on the level of the Bill of Rights and what do we have? We have quite a few problems. Think of what we are doing to our natural inheritance, what we are doing to the earth. Think of the things we are doing to each other in war, or pillage, and crime. And realize that it isn't a God in our heaven that is going to react upon us. It is the God in us. It is the God in the slain soldier, the God in the mortally wounded infant, the, the God in the murdered mother that hurts. And this pain goes through the whole of humanity because we have one blood of God. And as it circulates through the body to nourish all the parts of the body, so it circulates throughout the world to nourish all the world. And whenever this is lost or broken or defiled, this love is hurt. And of course it is this love really which is salvation. To keep it and achieve it and will live with it is to have everlastingness. It was a little strict, a little surviving uh, took place. Then he turned from it because they couldn't understand it. But many nations did understand it, strangely enough. And in many of the greater nations of the world, especially in the East, early Christian missionaries were rather welcome. China received them with open arms. Japan tolerated them except for a brief time when they abused their own privileges. But for the most part, the whole world has not been evil in this sense. When Muhammad went to the caves of Mahia in order to uh, hope that he might receive the revelation of the original religion of mankind, the angel Jaboriel brought him the scarfs with the words written in fire upon them. And all of these early writings were a search for one truth. Muhammad cried that in the midst of all the different gods and all the different beliefs, like the tablets on Mars Hill, he wanted to know which one was really God. Which one was Allah? Who was the true God of all things? Paul's answer to that was that all these gods together are one. That all these different beliefs are vitalized by the same inner life of man. And that all of these beliefs, well lived, will fulfill their purpose and in the end will bring the individual into absolute harmony 
with all the honest convictions of mankind. All this Paul Paul was uh, in some kind of difficulty. He went he got to Rome, he was in trouble. But as a citizen of Rome, he could not be tortured or crucified. And when the time of his martyrdom came, he was beheaded. But in the uh, end of it all, he made payment for the youth of doubt and uncertainty which had afflicted him. And he went forth fully convinced that he was of the one and in the one and to the one. In other words, the soul within him was indestructible. And that was the only thing that was important. And in that, he was one again with his grain or seed of immortality, which we all have in our hearts. So at the time of the session at Mars Hill, uh, Paul announced that he would return probably at another time, but he never did, to give more instruction to these people concerning the mystery of the unknown God. But he went to other places, but in the various books and works attributed to Paul, he solves a great many of the mysteries of the unknown God. But he does admit beyond question that there is only so far that he can go, that anyone can go, and that in the end he must depend upon faith, and that this faith in turn is strong enough to sustain eternal love. Love is the final work of mankind. Love of truth, love of God, love of nature, and love of all human beings and other creatures of nature. And we are all bound into one great family, moving mysteriously on a great ark, which we call the earth, which is a vast ship moving in space. We are all on it, being carried over a great uncertainty to wait for the coming of the, of the dry land on the crest of Ararat. We are all on this great journey in this great ship, the planet Earth. Here we have to live in rather crowded quarters, which are likely to be more crowded, but crowding instead of an inconvenience might be a basis of a new intimacy, a new understanding, a new closeness which people have sought to avoid. Today we are always happy to have lots of ground and land around the house so that we're not too close to other people. But unfortunately in our conduct we are seldom very close to anyone. We are simply living as isolated units of self-satisfaction in a vast sea, a world of life. If we can dispose of the idea uh, that each of these individuals is completely separate and that all can bow down together and pray to their various gods, if we can get over this idea, this concept of things, we can realize that we are none of us separate. We are none of us something that can bow down to some personal concept of divinity. What we are is one nation, one people, one faith, bowing down to the infinite wisdom of the eternal. This is our hope and our salvation in these times. And this is the journal, this is the journey that Paul made from being a hater of Christ to a believer in Christ, and perhaps the, one of the first to distinguish this concept of Jesus as a person and Christ as an eternal fact, and that this eternal fact was embodied in Jesus, he does not doubt. He does not doubt that Jesus was a, the great teacher of mankind, but Jesus was also one of, of the sparks, one of the souls in the great soul of eternity. He was a, one of the advanced souls that had come forth simply because of the wisdom and insight within himself and had been sent forth by God, the God in his own soul, to serve the world and to preach to it a doctrine of universal brotherhood. Now in 1980 some odd years later, we are still suffering seriously from the lack of brotherhood. That is necessary to peace, contentment, hope, and security. Now we uh, see in the paper every day why there are laws that must be passed, as in the case of the Bill of Rights. But we notice that the Bill of Rights protects us in certain ways. It gives us privileges. It gives us the right to create a destiny. 
It gives the country a right to create a destiny. And it also gives to the family the right to build a solid structure in human society. It cuts through races and languages and all these barriers and makes it possible for each human being to be free. Free from the great era of all time, selfishness. Free from false gods, wealth, power, fame. These are the deities that most worship. And they are, as we know from St. Augustine, the false gods. In all of these different things, we find in Paul that he personifies the common faults of mankind and gives them a special flavor and coloring for our improvement. We know really, beyond all doubt, that a heathen is actually a person who does not believe in God, so-called. Factually, the word means a palmer, but we don't use it that way anymore. Yeah, but a heathen to us is an unbeliever. Uh, but that isn't necessarily true. If by an unbeliever we mean someone that doesn't agree with us, it's totally false. A, a heathen is really one who has not established the integrity within the core of himself by which he can dominate his own insecurities. The Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount are written in letters of fire and blood in the life circulation of every human being. It is the human being who becomes the treasury of the treasurer of these things. He is the one who must become the custodian. He is the living temple made without hands. He is truth itself, but he doesn't know it. And in the course of trying to find it, he is deluded into many courses of procedure which are false and which would not be tolerated. So now we have a, a new roof coming. We're going to rewrite the Constitution. We're going to do all kinds of wonderful things, but are we really working at anything? Are we really trying to make contact with the best part of ourselves? Are we also putting ourselves under the censorship of enlightened mind? Are we using the mind to find out our own mistakes, or are we just going to keep on trying to find mistakes in other people? Are we going to use the equipment that has been given to us to rectify ourselves, to discover in ourselves the secret of the three great worlds that exist, the divine world, the human world, and the material world? They are all in us. They are all part of us. They are all part of the great solar system that exists within our own flesh. We are a universe, and as actually we're known, we probably have more component parts than the planet Earth has. Each of us has more parts, more little cells, more lives inside. And over this whole economy is the power of will, and the power of mind, and the power of love. When we go by will, we will become dictators. If we come by mind, we may become materialists. But if we come by love, then we shall understand and discover the magnificent amateurs of life how they are all part of one eternal, beautiful purpose. And when we understand this, we have made a great achievement in the future. On the other side of the coin, as far as Paul is concerned, is this tremendous pressure within the man. And this pressure has alienated many people. I know that many people think of Paul, more or less, as very cruel or very crude. And he may have been all these things. But he also has within his writings, certainly, some of the most unusual and extraordinary statements to be found in the religious literature of the world. He is the only one, as far as we can understand, who has finally come to the conclusion that regardless of everything, there is only one God, one humanity, and one pattern of truth. We are all born into all three. And it is our privilege to use these to release ourselves from the despondence which have closed us in. We, have, we cannot solve the international problem until we discover the common life of humanity. As long as, we, as long as there are strangers, there will be enemies. As long as we cannot forgive our neighbor, 
we cannot forgive our world. As long as our hopes are not supported by our deeds, our hopes do not come true. And wherever we do it badly, we suffer. And then in our suffering, we raise our eyes and hands in anguish, asking God to relieve us of a pain or an ache or a problem that we ourselves have caused. The, the, the deity uh, of Paul doesn't have to forgive anything because it is inside of us and knows exactly what we've done every moment. It knows when we are sorry. It knows when we have made a, a proper penalty and paid it. It knows exactly the degree of our guilt and of our uh, integrity. It knows when we are telling the truth, whether others do or not. Therefore, the Christ of Paul knocks at the door of our hearts, comes in and sits with us and breaks bread. And in that presence, we have the final custodian of the code, the keeper of the way of light. And this keeper has been imprinted in us, implanted in us from the beginning of time from the beginning of our existence, even the little weeds of it. Everything has this infinite potential to grow and become more, to grow and fulfill. A man is one of the highest forms of life that has been integrated. Therefore, he has a very special duty and a very special responsibility. It is up to him to recognize that his humanity is, is, is a responsibility. His humanity brings him an obligation to the eternity of things. Humanity makes him one of those that cannot fail. And all failure is apparent only, but is punished by those insecurities which ultimately lead to the correction of the mistake. Life is forever correcting the mistakes of those who live it. And if the living is too poor or the corruption is too great, then we have the necessary penalties imposed upon us. But they come not from outside. They do come not from houses built of wood and stone. They come from the eternal life of God in everything. The blood coursing through the brain and through the body is the river of life. It is that which carries in it the intangible, mysterious, alchemical procedures by which all things are redeemed. Blood is Mephisto says in Faust is a most peculiar essence. It is different from anything else. The saving blood of Golgotha is a symbol of that which is meant, in which deities bleeds for the sake of humanity. And that in some mysterious way we are all gradually growing up to redeem and release the mysterious Prometheus who has been bound to the rock because of our misdoings and because he tried to save us. So all of these things were undoubtedly known to Paul. He knew about these things. But uh, take our founding fathers. One of the great points that most of them have emphasized is, will be found in the Acts of the Apostles, the Romans and the Corinthians, these the Bible books. The right of individuals to worship according to conscience, which is one of the free religious freedoms that our founding fathers gave us. Uh, the right to, to go against infamy wherever it arises. The right to prevent the misuse of resources. The right to make payments and to refrain from unnecessary debt. The right not to have troops billeted in our homes. All these things are part of the rights that the Bill of Rights is supposed to give us. And this only way this Bill of Rights can be effective is because it is right. And if there's anything in it that is not right, it will have to be amended. But the purpose of it was to make right the basis of the American life way. It was to prevent the American life way from becoming stagnant from becoming set in patterns which were undesirable and to prevent the gradual corruption of the democracy which uh, was bought at so high a price. And yet today we are not watching the Bill of Rights. We are interested in our own rights but not interested in our neighbor's rights. We are interested only in the advancement of ourselves. And Paul would have listed this 
as one of the greatest heresies with which the world has been uh, afflicted since the beginning of time. There is no reason why humanity cannot cooperate. There is no reason why it is not possible for peace to be achieved. The reason it isn't achieved is because the Christ in us has not been allowed to express itself. It has been locked in by avarice. It has been locked in by the profit system, commercialization. And it has been locked in by materialism, which has refused to permit the soul to function in the average life of people. These things are the liberties which we have lost or canceled when we refuse to listen or deny the rights of our own souls then we are committing a mistake, a serious one. We are disobeying the right of every person to be right. And this is the thing that the Bill of Rights was originally intended for. Many of those men who signed that, like Benjamin Franklin, were not theologically focused. They didn't go to church every day or anything of that nature. But most of them were patriots. And to be a patriot, a true patriot, you have to, first of all, be true to God. The divine power is the thing to which we must all give allegiance. We must all serve first the truth that is eternal. Now, as this century comes to a close, and it's coming pretty fast now, we are being faced more and more with the danger of not recognizing the importance of changing our ways and patterns. We have to begin to live the truth. We have to begin to follow not only Paul but all the apostles, and not only all the apostles but all the religions of the earth that have tried to show us. We will have to begin to do it right. We will have to begin to allow faith, hope, and love to dominate our relationships with each other, our families, and our own inner selves. We cannot go on continually forgetting that which is real and nursing that which has no substance and be a happy, progressive people. It is interesting to see that now, particularly, there has been a great revival of interest in better things. Fifty years ago, idealism was practically extinct in this country, held only in private by a few profound thinkers. Today, idealism is raving through the land. It is going everywhere, in every form, some good, some bad, some indifferent. But here, the definite effort to recognize the importance of beauty, the importance of friendship, the importance of honor, these things are coming home to us through the most natural possible means, the results and consequences of rejecting them. By rejection, we have brought ourselves to this state. By reclaiming them, we have to bring ourselves back again to the principles and to the ideals that Paul enunciated on the Hill of Mars. The Hill of Mars, incidentally, was the place where the Greeks gathered for gossip. It was a place where public opinion expressed itself. It was a kind of a spit-and-argue club that kept the Athenians more or less contented with life. They talked about everything, discussed with strangers what was happening in other lands, and uh, on occasion held courts there to judge the virtues or vices of certain accused persons. But in, the his, in this hill was the, the great listening post of the Greek states, and uh, it was originally dedicated to the deity Mars, and it's interesting because Montmartre in France, where now a great cathedral stands, was also a hill of Mars. Mars was more than just a god of war. Mars was, a, Mars was a god of do it, a courage, a conduct, and a determination to be right. And uh, the great war is not another Armageddon. The great war is a struggle between the individual and his own pocketbook. It is a struggle between the person, his desires, his appetites, his commitments, and his determination to compete successfully with someone else. This is the great war. Competition is the strife that has to end. Little by little, if we don't cure it ourselves, we will so dissipate our natural resources and so destroy the nature which has been given to us 
that we can no longer subsist or exist without a reformation. We are still, however, in a period when a conscious, constructive reformation is possible. We are now at a time when we can do things better, we should do them better, and we should do what Paul also recommends. Regard not a house built by the hands of man as the temple of God, but to recognize the universe as the house of the eternal, and that in all ways and in every respect we owe homage to this, and it isn't here, not in some man-made building, that we must worship the eternal truths of life. If we can do this, and if we are able to succeed in this particular allotment, we will find ourselves in very much better condition and able to do many things that now seem impossible. Well, I think I'm going to have to stop now, but that's for this time. Next time we'll do better. I've never, I haven't been a good walker for some time, and I'm not improving. But I may have to develop the necessary physical exercises. But this was not something that hit me as an innocent bystander. It was something that has been developing, and you probably have noticed it yourself. I may not have thought of it particularly, but you've noticed that there have been young men standing by the way when I leave the platform to kind of help me out and little things like that. That's been going on for a long time. But they tell me because of the fact that it did show itself as what it really is, that it uh, will probably respond to improvement. Now, our subject this morning is the 17, in the 17th chapter of Acts, Paul on the Hill of Mars. The personality of St. Paul is one of the most controversial in Christian theology. First, he was an ardent anti-Christian. Then he was an ardent Christian. By doing this, he managed to alienate both groups. He managed to outrage the school of Heliol and Gamaliel, which he belonged to in Judaism, and he frightened the apostles to death. Nobody liked Paul for some reason, probably himself, and it's sometimes doubtful from the text that he liked himself very well. It was a very strange thing, but he was a man of destiny, no matter how you want to figure it. And the importance of his position is just beginning to be noticeable. At the time when uh, the Protestant Reformation took over, there was a very strong division between the old orthodoxy and something new, something represented by things such as the Rosicrucians and the alchemists and the mystics. And uh, in this division, we saw the real division between Peter and Paul. We saw Peter's church at Rome and the Cathedral of St. Paul, and see how this affected Paul, and why it changed him in a moment from an enemy of Christianity to one of its greatest martyred exponents. But it was definitely true that to Paul, the Christ in you is the hope of glory. And in God and in Christ we live and move and have our being. And uh, as he says in this chapter, the poet says, we are his children. This poet was Eratos of Soli, the great writer of the phenomenon of astronomy, which Paul evidently understood. Paul had another distinction that separated him from the rest of the group. Paul was a citizen of Rome, and in that time this was a very important consideration. At the time of the siege of Tarsus, when the Romans came to take the city, the city did not resist, but opened its doors and accept the Romans, to accept the Romans. As a result of that, the Romans spared the city completely, did not pillage it or worry it or bother it in any way, and made every inhabitant of Tarsus a, and a citizen of Rome. Now this citizenship descended to Saul, later Paul, and became the basis of a great many privileges and opportunities otherwise impossible. It was impossible, according to Roman law, that anyone should be convicted or condemned without a, doubt, without a due process of law. Every effort had to be made for justice. This was not true with non-citizens. 
So Paul had this distinction of being able to travel with comparative impunity. He has considerable language, was able to speak better and more often and uh, more carefully than most of the other early Christian writers and authors. He was definite in London, the two great anchors of the Christian theology. The uh, Western branch, which came out of the United States, was mostly composed of the Paul Pollitt's party. Uh, St. Paul inspired most of New England, and uh, the reason for this was that Paul broke away from the insistency of an intercessor between the individual and God. Uh, the, uh, Paul took the attitude that deity was available to all and could be directly approached by those who wish to supplicate God for one purpose or reason or another. There was no need for an intermediate character, no person between, only the, the noble heart, the contrite spirit, and the prayer, and the dedication of life. This was the basis of the Protestant Reformation. Now, the founding fathers of our country, which we are much interested in at the present moment, uh, were mostly of the Protestant uh, religious denominations. They believed very largely in the principles of Paul, which, however, unless you are a student of the subject and read his writings carefully, you may not notice the tremendous emphasis upon personal liberty and the disciplining of life to carry liberty with dignity. Now this was certainly involved and incorporated into the Bill of Rights. It was certainly part of all New England with its religious dedications. It was in the spirit of Emerson and Thoreau, and most of all, it was in the spirit of mysticism. The one convert were mentioned in the occasion of Paul's visit to the Hill of Mars was Dionysus the Areopagite. And the mysticism of Dionysus, the mystical experience, was the first great written mystical book of Christian theology. It was probably written in Alexandria, but it was certainly a book suitable to the mind of people like Bamey and William Law and the pietists of Pennsylvania. It was a book of devotion, dedication to a mystic overall, a great picture, a great principle of things. Paul tells us in his own words that God put the same blood in every human being. Now this is regardless of nation, race, or demark. We are all one in the circulation of the blood and spirit of God. Now this, of course, would cause, and did cause, considerable controversy, but I think it also gave us to understand the meaning of a statement that was made by a uh, British author some years ago, Gerald Massey, namely, the Jesus of Peter and the Christ of Paul. The apostles, for most of them, personally acquainted with Jesus for a period of several years. They were of his race and of his faith. They were uh, constantly associated with him and developed a tremendous personal affection for him. He became the embodiment of that which was most desirable, most lovable, and most sacred. Paul never had this experience. His first experience with Christ was on the road to Damascus, where in a vision the Lord appeared to him. So his first experience with Christianity was a vision, not a familiarity, not a long association, but a sudden impact of a supernatural event. We can uh, thank you very much. Uh, because of the unusual circumstances, I think maybe you should have a slight explanation of the facts of the matter, mm -hmm. just for general preservation. And if you can't hear me, I'll ask them to make the microphone a little louder, because at the present time I'm not in good voice either. 
but uh, I have been in a health problem without knowing it. For about a year and a half, I haven't enjoyed walking very much. And I said, well, you don't at 85. At least it's not unusual. So it got a little worse all the time. First, you know, I didn't like to climb stairs. And then steps. And then I wasn't too happy on the level. <laughs> and finally, uh, it became obvious that uh, either I was advancing in age very rapidly or something else was wrong. The answer is something else was wrong. And uh, what was wrong has been growing and developing and unfolding for a year and a half. And it came to a head after I came back from Sedona. It came to a head because it was ready to. Nothing there particularly contributed to it. It just proved conclusively that I couldn't do these things. So then I got a little help, and I've been under physical therapy uh, ever since, and they were gaining on it. And they tell me that the chances of a good recovery are all right. The blood pressure is normal, uh, the heart is right, and there's no cholesterol, so I may get well. Thank <laughs> you.